If Reality Check Radio enriches your day and life, support us to keep bringing you the content, voices, perspectives, and dose of reality you won't get anywhere else. Visit www.realitycheck.radio forward slash donate. Winston Peters has been dominating the news since his State of the Nation speech. The media have misrepresented it. Chris Hipkins attacked and got sat back on his derriere. And Winston is laughing all the way to the Parliament. Deputy Prime Minister Winston Peters, welcome back to The Crunch. The last time we spoke uh, officially was uh, Election Eve, where you gave me an interview uh, just after the results had come in. Yes, I did. Actually, the first interview I did with anyone. That's right. And and it unhinged David Fisher at the Herald something fi- um, wicked as well. <laughs> well, you know, why doesn't he wise up? <laughs> The, the, the idea that they know everything when the circumstances are not in their control, it quite alarms me. But he's, he's usually a good writer, David, but sometimes he lets himself down, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I have a different point of view on that, but that's more of a personal issue yeah. that I have. But um, he, he has been a good journalist in the past, but unfortunately lets himself down um, rather too frequently these days. But don't the media let themselves down all the time? And a case in point is is the little contretemps that's going on now between the media and yourself um, with the reporting of your State of the Nation speech? Well, here's the thing. What happened here was they didn't take what I said. They took what they thought I said and then went bonkers with it. And then in a question to me, in person, not part of the speech, I confirmed another aspect. But they still Mm -hmm. added to the speech and on they went. And words like genocide... And Holocaust was never in my speech at all. No. And all those people that use those words, dare I say, Nazis, Holocaust, genocide. Yeah, I've got countless. I've got a whole file of them now, from Waititi to uh, Golres, and sad to say, all sorts of people. Packer making all those comments, genocide and what have you. Not one journalist went to them, but when they thought they had a chance to gaslight me, they had a go. But I'm watching the social media. The social media is awful for them. Well, that's the thing. I saw uh, this morning a comment from the new uh, co-leader of the Greens, Chloe Swarbrook, who said that it was, you know, crazy behaviour. And um, I was sitting there thinking, hang on a second, weren't you the one who had a tea towel draped around your shoulder shouting from the river to the sea with great vehemence, uh, you know, promoting a, a, a chant um, that actually does celebrate or indeed invoke uh, genocide. Well, after the 7th of October last year, in that appalling uh, terrorist attack on Israel, did she say a word? No. No, not a mutter, not a murmur. That's why you cannot trust people who are just unbalanced when it comes to things like that there. But my point to the mainstream media is you're not going to get away with trying to gaslight me. You're not going to go to Luxon and say to him, Winston said this when he hasn't even heard me say it, and then impute various things about that when, uh, and then expect him to react. The reality of it all is, I made it very clear in our convers- my conversation with Mr. Luxon that I've been saying this for 40 years. I believe in one standard of citizenship with equal rights in this country called New Zealand, and I always have, and I'm always going to defend it because without that, the moment you get, as what he said, claiming that Maori had a superior DNA. The flow on of that superiority is to imply and impute and then put into place policies of inferiority, and you know how bad that looks. So we're not backing down at all. Rather, we're going to rock it, rock it up because people need to know that there's a, this country called New Zealand has fallen dramatically on the basis of divisive, divisive policies like co-governance. Co-governance based on what? Race. Mm. That's simple. And worse than that, based on ethnic numbers, where sometimes the numbers impute Maori when the person's got one part in 512. See the fiction and the fraud that's going on here? Meanwhile, real issues of Maori want housing, health, education, access to education, uh, to health, uh, health, education and housing, and first world wages just passed by the wayside. Ma- Maori want the same thing as everybody else. Yeah. That and, is. and if that's the case, why aren't we just everybody else? I was showing a, a graphic uh, on on X, formerly known as Twitter, uh, yesterday, and and it it's just got a short message, but it applies to this this topic that we're talking about. 
It says it didn't start with the gas chambers. It started with one party controlling the media, one party controlling the message, one party deciding what is truth, one party censoring speech and controlling the opposition, one party dividing citizens into us versus them, and calling on their supporters to harass them. It started when good people turned a blind eye and let it happen. And that's what we saw in between 2020 and 2023. That's exactly what we saw in New Zealand. Yeah, that's the truth. There's a famous um, Niemöller from Germany who mm. said that and he's going through all the groups. They came for so-and-so and I wasn't one of them. And I came, they came for so-and-so and it wasn't one of them. And he goes through all the cases and said, and then they came for me and there was not nobody left yeah. to defend me. Uh, and he wasn't precisely right. So these people are extrapolating their interpretations with no authority or veracity whatsoever. But what's been amazing, I can tell you, but I can't give you the names, but the number of senior experienced journalists have called me to say, stick to it. You're on the right pathway. Don't leave off. Well, that's the feedback that I'm getting, you know, walking, just walking on the beach this morning at Takapuna. Uh, I had someone stop me and say, are you, do you see what Winston's doing? He's saying the right thing. This is what, what people on the street are saying, or on the beach in this case, are saying. Well, that's the thing. But what is imaged here and is, screams it is that you've got people in the media who think that they're so special, that they've got tremendously unique insights, that everybody else out there is a nobody. It's that arrogance that I find quite crushing. And worst of all, that's that arrogance that leads people to not report everything in the marketplace, but only one booth in the marketplace, so to speak. The old you know, media town crier of the former age saying, over here, over here, all these products and over there. No, they're just talking about one product, the one that they support. I was on the AM show this morning, uh, morning show uh, for, for um, TV soon, One, rather. The soon to be defunct. Well, uh, the thing was, they began with a lie and thought they could stick to it. Mm. And so you know, you've got to kick back as hard as you can because I was saying your listeners need to know what the truth is, and they're not hearing from you. <laughs> they wouldn't have liked that. Oh, no, no. Well, they, were, they had that staggered look. How dare he talk to me this way? And I feel like saying, how dare you perform so badly when your producer's going to be watching you and knowing that's not going down too good for you, if you're a medium, that is. Well, you just have to look at what's happening on 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 X. You know, Tover O'Brien uh, put up uh, something yesterday uh, on X, and almost every comment on it is, "Why don't you shut up?" Winston's right. That was incredible. It's about nine nine to one. Oh, it's it's terrible. They call it ratioing. She got absolutely yeah. sl slammed. I thought they're going to accuse me of doing all the um, tweets and and all the uh, comments, but I didn't. I just hadn't been referred to there by one of my staff, said, you better go and have a look at that. Yeah. And it's extraordinary. And, you know, I'm saddened by them because it means that their duration in this in this industry is not going to be for much longer. What was interesting is that uh, the spin-off and Tova O'Brien went running off to the probably the sole remaining living <laughs> band member of a, of a one-hit wonder band. And, the guitarist. Uh, He's the lead guitarist and uh, tried to create a stink over that. Uh, uh, your press releases show that you got, you're having immense fun with all of this. And I particularly well, like the one where you said you, you were going to pick a, another song from them, but you found they didn't have any. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But the thing is, here we are at Palmerston North, and the, maybe they're always back to people outside, but it's preposterous to think all the way there in Liverpool after all those years the band when it has been disbanded, they had a view. Oh, no, they didn't. Some lefty shill from spinoff wrongly informed the guy, and by the time he'd made up his mind, he was adamant about it, but at the very close, he wasn't too certain about it, even in that interview. And as for the legal side, but I thought this was extraordinary. They went off to get it to a legal expert as well. And with the greatest respect to that legal expert, he ain't no expert on this matter. You show me the precedent case he's talking about. Now, I'm not talking about NMM and National because they were using it in their campaign advertising. Yeah. I was just talking about a public meeting. Yeah, exactly. But it's a massive beat up. But, mm. you know, I was talking to a mate and he says, you know, Cam, I reckon Winston probably slipped a few quid to that band to, to, <laughs> to, have, to have a go so that he could keep the story running um, for another day. Well, there are people out there who are so disconnected and so unbalanced, they would believe that instantly.
Well, they probably <laughs> they probably <laughs> they probably would. You, look, it's been going for f- four days now. Do you think you can get it to carry on till the weekend? Oh, they will not leave off until they find out on by Sunday that it's all over. But it'll go all the way to the weekend because there are variations on their bias. Yeah. Have you ever had a State of the Nation speech that has had so much coverage? No. <laughs> no. No, that's the part they're going to accuse me of. You did it all to get coverage. No, I didn't. I just made one statement and all of a sudden they're there, there. All these journalists were there. They didn't like me telling them, though, things like, for example, what did you do about talking about the true state of the economy last year? The public interest fund, the bribes, what did you do about that? You guys did nothing. That's what I said to them all. And of course, probably they're sitting there. They're sitting there with what I, a new uh, thing called, it's a psychological condition called recognition hunger. <laughs> and, group, yeah. and a medical condition called group venom. And they decided to attack me. And I thought, ah, uh, there's a famous line from a General Abrams. He made his name in the Second World War in the forest on the outskirts of Germany, France. And he got cut off. He had a 250 men on his control. He got cut off by the Germans and uh, is in serious isolation. And those days they used to have a backpack that's half the size of a done, a car on your back as the phone. And his yeah. general finally got in contact with them. And what the, the conversation went right through the American troops in a sense. And they said, we've got to go and find this guy. But the general said to him, what's happening? What's happening? And he said, what's happening? They've surrounded us again, the poor bastards. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I feel at the moment, right? <laughs> well, they've surrounded you again, but you're about to fight your way through them. <laughs> <laughs> well, they said, we've got to go and find that guy. He's got the right attitude. Well, they, they actually named the uh, the Abrams tank after him. That's how, how revered he is in the U.S. Army. Yes, he went on to be a uh, commander of Allied Forces. Vietnam, sadly, was a war they should never have entered. Yeah. They hadn't studied the true state of the affairs over there between Vietnam and uh, China. But that's another story. Oh, yes. We can talk history all day long, as you and I um, do often. Um there's a lot of talk. You know, Bryce Edwards wrote an article on uh, on Tuesday uh, saying that you know the government's in trouble. They've they've only got this much percentage in in you know, an average of the polls. You've got Benedict Con- Collins who's saying, "Is the has the prime minister told you off? Has he has he ticked you off? Are you in trouble with that?" You've got all oh, these other that? journalists. What is the state of the coalition, uh, Winston? Well, this Benedict Collins who. Called me, asked me one time, are you a crook? You know, this would be with respect to the serious fraud office. Mm. So we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, brother, of our own money in two major court cases and win both times. And he never has the decency to apologize. Then the last thing he shouted out the other day, this is how arrogant he is, he said, as the Prime Minister told you to pull your head in, isn't it a great question for a journalist to ask? As he's mm. Prime Minister told you to pull your head in, see how frustrating he is? Mm. And he said, my, my answer is, you know, Benedict, I can't see you lasting long on this profession at all, not down in Parliament. People like you are going to become irrelevant. Well, that's right. They can become irrelevant because everyone recognises how biased they are and yeah. so no one then wants to talk to them. And when, when you're a journalist in, in the press gallery, you need people to talk to you. Um, otherwise, yeah. you're not going to get stories. Well, you know, the great PR people, the great uh, well lobbyists for that matter, and great journalists also, have one feature, they talk to everybody. Yeah. And that's critical. That's why that's why they're telling the marketplace what the um, product of ideas is on the market. They tell them what the full quality of uh, the product is, not just one product. You know, I look back at the press gallery and I, there's some pretty, you know, uh, famous names there, just brilliant journalists that have sadly, yeah. you know, there's not many of them left. In fact, I'd argue there's probably only one left. Um, and, and he's only working part time uh, at at his job, but the rest of them seem to have no understanding of history, no understanding of how the political process works, and they're running around trying to get somebody uh, yes. on things that are not important. No one in the street cares whether or not Chris Hitkins says that you're you're like the drunk uncle at, <laughs> <laughs> at a wedding. But, you know, um, no one cares about that sort of stuff. What they care about is how much their petrol costs, uh, whether their mum or their dad can get a hip operation or something like that, whether the teachers are teaching the kids how to read and write and spell things properly. 
that's what people care about, not these sledges and not these uh, idiotic gotcha type moments. Well, you know, my reaction to Mr. Hipkins is, Mr. Hipkins, when you can tell me what a woman is, I'll take you seriously. Yeah. But this is how bad he was. He was asked, can you, Mr. Hipkins, describe what a woman is? And he said, I'll get back to you. See what's wrong? Totally. Now, as the foreign minister, I've got a bit of an interest in the Pacific, having been born in Fiji. You've just recently come back from a trip to Fiji. How'd that go? It was excellent, actually. It was really quite comprehensive as well. We went to the um, barracks, so to speak. Victoria uh, Barracks, yep. Yes, we, we went there for a reception they put on. It was huge. Caught me totally unawares. And then I spent some time with uh, a number of uh, um, people over there. But I got a chance to probably meet, well, half the cabinet at one function, which is great, really. And I had to spend some time with Ram Booker, who I know, have known for a long, long time, and others, and leader, the leader of the um, uh, other political persuasions. I got to see some of them. And all in all, it was uh, reinforcement of the reconnection, and, and we're going to have to do a whole lot more work with Fiji and, of course, the Pacific Forum. The Pacific Forum is there, the Pacific Islands Forum. But we signaled all that. And then since that time, look, I have been to India to talk to their foreign minister, and we talked with them about a program that they've got to set up a hospital in, guess where? Fiji. Yeah. A new Indian hospital in Fiji. And then I talked to the foreign minister for Indonesia on my way back as well, and I was talking about a wide range of subjects, including Fiji, and they're going to work with us together, New Zealand and Indonesia, to put together a project in Fiji. So it's really quite exciting when you think about it. Yeah, because there's uh, uh, been a lot of inroads made into the Pacific by China uh, using, you know, using their cash to curry favour with Pacific nations. And New Zealand and Australia have sat there in, in many respects wagging their finger at, at these Pacific nations whilst the Chinese have been, you know, burying millions and millions of dollars into their own infrastructure. Well, it's been my concern, and it was for some time long in my younger political career, as to the approach being taken by New Zealand and Australia, where the Pacific Islands uh, were concerned. And my approach has been decidedly different. I've spelt it out over and over again. And that is when you're, no matter how small that country is, when you're in that country or you're work, talking with them, never underestimate the need for them to be regarded as total equals. Mm. We expect that when dealing with large countries. They've got a right to expect it when we're dealing with small island nations. You know, every time I've been in Fiji talking to government people, and this goes back quite some years, uh, back to the Bainimarama years, the feedback that I got from locals in, in Suva was that they quite like Kiwis coming up there and doing business and, and being involved in the government level. They really don't like Australians an awful lot, uh, other than for the tourism. Well, there have been changes in Australia's approach as well of late. And uh, I've got no doubt that they would have seen Maurice Payne, the, she's the previous to Penny Wong, foreign minister, they'd have seen a different person, a different approach. But certainly I've sought or always to ensure that they could never accuse me of patronising or coming the senior soldier or, and all those things, which we Kiwis hate. Yeah. Which should not replicate in our behaviour either. Now, how about the, uh, the recent visit from China to New Zealand? How did that go? Oh, well, it was great to reconnect with Wang Yi. I mean, he was a foreign minister for a long time. And then he left that scene, another person took his place, and all of a sudden, mid last year, there was a switch back to Wang Yi. And I've never asked what happened to the previous one, but uh, so I was reconnecting with him for the first time since 2018 in China when I was last saw him. I've seen him in a different forum after that, but not in China. And uh, they were obviously, how shall I put it, not in an unnice way, but they were on a charm offensive. And mm. so <laughs> we, had a, we had a great discussion about a lot of things, something we didn't agree on. I raised the issues, you know, like um, the Uyghurs, uh, like Hong Kong, what happened to the one country, two uh, systems, which I was aware of on that handover, which I attended in 1997. It's a long time ago. Mm. So I was saying to him, you know, uh, if we've got a difference with you, we're going to politely, if you don't mind, speak our mind. It's called treating people as equal. It's funny because I haven't seen any of that reported in the New Zealand media anywhere. 
particularly well, that you raised the the issue with the Uyghurs. The New Zealand media, I got five, six journalists in to tell them specifically what happened. I gave them the time of day, early in the next morning. Uh, no, guess what they've reported on in the main? They've reported on Foreign Minister Wong is in New Zealand, but he's going to Australia. <laughs> How do you like that? That was the headline. But I would have thought raising the issue yeah, of the Uyghurs, which is kind of a third rail issue for the Chinese, yes, um, would have been reported. I mean, if if Jacinda Ardern had met, met the Chinese foreign minister and raised the Uyghurs, they would have been waxing lyrical about how she challenged the the, the Chinese foreign minister. You're exactly right. But, you know, Wang Yi, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi got to see Chris Luxon. He got to see um, the Trade Minister Todd McClay. Now, you've got to ask yourself, why didn't they think that was, was worth covering? This fellow's coming from this huge economy, big population, second biggest population to India in the world. He's in our country, and they didn't think it was worthy of headlines. So it begs the, the question, don't they understand that trade is critical to our future? Well, otherwise we'll all sit around um, cutting each other's hair and um, thinking everything's wonderful. Yeah, and taking, each, taking each other's washing and going broke. Yeah. For New Zealand, trade is imperative, but it has to be trade on fair terms. You, but you're quite right, and, and on fair terms. But, you know, our trade has been seriously enormous help to us and it's been enormous help to China because Chinese need to feed their people. They need to do a lot of things, and they know they haven't got all the resources, and so that's been good for them as well. But um, here we are, a country highly dependent on trade, and our media don't seem to understand it. What the, on earth's going wrong here? And more We're worried more about people. whether or not you used the, the right song or not. Ah, uh, yes, you know. And yet, let me say, that is the point. They said he's been using it in all his meetings. No, I haven't. Somebody on my staff thought it was quite a funny idea, and I thought, Actually, they're right. It sounds good. I'll try it. Did it down in Palmer's North. I had no idea that reverberating on the BBC would be my meeting in Palmer's North. <laughs> How do you look like that? <laughs> uh, there's not many people can put Palmer's North on the map, and you've managed it. <laughs> it's hilarious. It's hilarious. Yeah, I mean, there were 700 people there. The photos I've seen of there, there was standing room only at the back. I mean, you, you didn't use the usual little trick of – putting out the chairs and then removing two rows so everybody has to stand. I mean, the National Party used to do that, I know, because Dad taught me that trick. There's only 600 uh, chairs there, and they were out more on the side, out the back door, and many people couldn't get in, so there's well over 700. you think that would be been important? No, they described it as a meeting of the party base. No, it wasn't. There was a stack of people there. I saw a whole lot of National Party people there for a start. You'd be pretty happy if you had 700 members in uh, Palmerston North, <laughs> wouldn't you? Well, yeah, but but, you, but you're being logical. you worked that <laughs> out. I'd have the biggest party in Australia if I had that many Palmerston North. But no, no, that's what they said. So what do you do? Well, you just press on I've regardless. Got, I've got to press on and keep on being reminded by my staff, Winston, be charitable, be forgiving, keep smiling. It's not so easy these days. Oh, no, I, I've seen a lot of smiling this week, and uh, you, you can thank the media for that. And, uh, you know, you're a busy man. I better let you go. Uh, yeah. Thank you for taking the time to talk to The Crunch, and uh, and we'll get you on again uh, sometime soon. Well, I'll just give you an idea now. I got up here got to work early this morning, but I have began the day by talking to the uh, Spanish foreign minister. I'm going to be talking to the Romanian ambassador from Canberra today at four o'clock, then on to the foreign minister for the Marshall Islands, and then on to the uh, ambassador for Egypt, and later on tonight, the foreign minister for Malaysia. So it's a heavy day's work, and it's all about this country's um, better cooperation and better advancement of our trade and our values and the rules-based system that keeps the countries like us going. There's a lot of work involved here, but no, no, they don't get that either. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't. Again, once again, Winston, thank you very much for the, uh, taking the time to speak to us. Thank you very much, and good luck to your show and your listeners. They love uh, hearing you on the show, Winston, so <laughs> they'll be very pleased to hear this. No, thank you very much. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Chris Hipkins might think Winston Peters is like a drunk uncle at a wedding.
but after his shellacking about wine biscuits, he may be a bit more circumspect in doing that again. Winston certainly isn't holding back with his contempt for the lying legacy media, and nor should he. Tell me your thoughts on what Winston had to say by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to, just like what you're listening to. Either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you. So connect with us today.